Hi, everyone. I'm Siobhan Sarna. I am the founder of SIBO SOS and the author of Healing SIBO. And I am here with Dr. Jason Harlock and Dr. Allison T. Becker, both world-renowned experts in the field of SIBO and the microbiome. And they have a very interesting situation that they wanted to share. And I'm so glad to be part of this conversation. So I'm gonna actually hand things over to Dr. Allison Seebecker so she can tell you about why this conversation, um, why it came to be and why she in particular is so excited about it. Hi, Dr. Seebecker. Hello. Uh, well, many, many years ago, um, I had asked Jason if he could let me know what he was seeing in the differences between glucose breath testing and lactulose breath testing because he did both on his patients, which is amazing. I didn't, I only did lactulose and I, I, I knew he liked glucose and I didn't wanna be missing anything. And um, it turns out that recently he prepared some um, for a presentation, some data and actually had triple breath, breath testing and reached out to me, let me know He's got some amazing results. And I was so excited in hearing your results, Jason, uh, that we wanted to just get it to everybody uh, because it was in you know, a presentation in a conference, um, an industry uh, conference, uh, and not everyone got to hear it. So e even including myself. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't get to hear the presentation because I was also presenting at the same time. So that's really how it came to be is, is that Jason remembered my, my question, wanted to provide me with really good data being a researcher, Jason's a researcher, and has that information now. And um, so Jason, why don't you give us your background on this? Thank you. And I apologize. It took some years to actually get <laughs> the data. I just didn't want to do it until I had like, I was, I was confident with the, the findings. Um, yeah. And I think I'll, I'll tell more with by the presentation, but um, I think really it was trying to work out the best way of diagnosing SIBO because we know that there's conflicting information in that, you know, North America is very lactulose um, biased for lack of a better word. Europe is often very glucose biased. And for me, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to do both and, and see things. But then I started seeing some other interesting patterns um, with fructose. And that's where we'll get into with this um, presentation and, and discussion afterwards. Perfect. So if you want to just start, share your screen. Yep, I will do that. All right, so I'm hopeful you can see the correct screen currently. <laughs> Would that be correct? Yes. Okay, great. So I'll get into it and then we'll have some time for questions afterwards. So for me, it was, it was really asking, is there time for a change in protocol around SIBO testing? And I want to place this argument within the context of a patient's story, because I think this kind of puts, illustrates it quite well, why this is important. Um, <clears throat> so the case, this is a 35-year-old male, presenting complaint, frequent belching but also diarrhea. And I always think that, that we always have to dig in deep with that term diarrhea because it means so many different things to different people. Now for this person, it was four day bowel movements per day and type six stools in the Bristol stool scale, definitely diarrhea. But I certainly have had patients who do one type five stool a day and, and classify as diarrhea. So it's like, it's not, <laughs> so you really have to dig into it. Definitely in this case, often greasy and pale, mucus, explosive and urgent at times, episodic bloating, episodic abdominal cramps, what he just defined as smelly flatulence, and gut symptoms were worse for white flower products, sweets, and many fruits. Not all, but many fruits. And plus there were systemic symptoms like brain fog, fatigue, low mood, and anxiety. You know, so pa a patient, um, you know, presentation pretty familiar to, to you, I reckon, Alison. Many others were dealing in the world of, of SIBO. Um, but yes, so let's go back a bit further. So the 13 year history of gut issues, and it started with, with increased bowel movement frequency and an abundance of what he defined as foul smelling flatulence and stools, but there was no obvious initiating event. So, you know, for many people, there's traveler's diarrhea or food poisoning, or even a course of antibiotics that I see as, a, as, a, as the sort of turning point moment, but there wasn't with this patient. Now, the first investigation that was done 13 years ago was a test for parasites and that found blastocystis. All right. And then from that point, he went to see a naturopath back in 2005. Um, and that naturopath was me, <laughs> a less hairy, less gray version of me, um, and a lot less experience. And I'd like to think with less wisdom, <laughs> too, for that matter. And I didn't do any further diagnostic testing with this patient. Um, I was like, 
okay, you've got symptoms that sound like that could be caused by this thing, blastocystis, let's just focus on killing that. So, you know, we did a blastocystis herbal protocol, probiotics for six weeks. Was there some improvement? Yeah, there was certainly some temporary improvement. All right. And then right, right after that, I moved interstate. <clears throat> it hadn't been in touch. And then seriously, 13 years later, get contacted by the same patient again with the same presentation, the same symptoms. And it's like, wow, here's an opportunity to do redo. And you don't often get that in life of a chance to redo something to see if you can do it much better. Um, and I'd like to think that I cured that 13 years later. And I think we did. Um, but it certainly had a lot to do with diagnostic workup, which I think we were, me and a lot of other practitioners over the years, as we'll soon see, were, were quite lazy in terms of diagnostic workups. So relevant family history, brother and daughter recently diagnosed as celiac disease and father had a long history of GERD. Um, and the reason I kind of flagged the GERD is that some people with celiac one of the main presenting complaints is GERD. It's not super common, but it still is, and it's often non-responsive to typical treatments. You know, so kind of it should be a red flag for us there. Previous investigations, just a lot of stool tests showing blaster, and that was all that was done for about ten years after our song was just stool test after blaster. Let's try to kill it. Test again. Kill test. Kill test. Um, with you know, not much change. But after his, his family members were diagnosed, he had oh, let's get celiac serology done. Normal antibody levels, but he hadn't actually been eating gluten leading up to the test. And this is, again, another one of those things that drive clinicians crazy. It's like, there's no point doing the test if you haven't gorged on gluten for six weeks leading up to it, because it's not going to be accurate. Um, gene test, positive for, for the genes, not surprisingly, for, for celiac. Again, and that was all more recently after the family member was diagnosed. Was some clinicians, a new clinician decided to do a bit of a, a deeper workup, which was great, because it gave us some additional data that we didn't see before. Now, previous treatments were all really based on trying to kill the blastocystis. So lots of flagell, um, sometimes with short-term release, and essentially a decade on herbal antimicrobials and probiotic off and on, you know, mostly on over that decade. 2012, there's a, there's a place in, in Sydney here in Australia called the Center for Digestive Diseases that, that really focuses on, on antibiotic cocktails to try to eradicate things like blastocystis. He did that, which is a pretty full-on um, triple antibiotic cocktail um, felt horrible during and, and some short term change and improvement in sinus symptoms afterwards. But again, short term tends to be the thing that runs through this case. Currently following anti candida diet. And yes, signs and symptoms were significantly better when he followed. So if he avoided the white flower products, avoided most fruits, avoided sugary things, symptoms were generally much reduced. Not gone, but much reduced. But you know, nobody did much in the way of investigations except for follow up parasite tests. That's it until very recently. So here's my chance of going, okay, seeing this person again, I didn't do a, a very good diagnostic workup at all when I first saw him back in 2005. Here's my chance to do a better one. So what we do, SIBO is obviously a top of the list. Now I can forgive myself a bit, my 2005 self, because SIBO wasn't really talked about much in 2005. It was just barely out there in the literature. Um, so and breath testing wasn't really talked about. So I, again, I can give myself a bit of forgiveness for not looking at SIBO back then. Um, you know, celiac disease is obviously going to be on there along with gluten sensitivity, fructose intolerance, because he seems to be reacting to, to fruit specifically, inflammatory bowel disease because of the, the diarrhea, we should always check. Um, and I put two at the bottom, blastocystis infection, you know, over the last 15 years, I, I look at blastocystis quite differently than I did in 2005. And I think the literature has come out showing that for many people, it's, it's normal and commensal and potentially beneficial member of the gut. So we shouldn't necessarily always assume it is the cause when present in some of these gut, gut symptoms. So for me, it's almost a diagnostic exclusion if we rule everything else first and then it's there. Yeah, I'll think of it a bit more. And as is diarrhea prone IBS, it's kind of like, well, we don't know why you've got diarrhea. <laughs> we'll label it IBS and you know, but we need to check things like SIBO first, obviously, and things like fructose intolerance in a case like this. So investigations, breath testing, glucose, lactulose, fructose. I did a leaky gut test and also fecal calprotectin looking for inflammatory bowel disease. But I think the, the breath testing protocol there is interesting because we looked, as I was saying at the very beginning, that we're looking at glucose and lactulose is kind of a standard thing I was doing for my SIBO patients. But over the years, and I'll get to the reason why, I started adding in fructose to the standard testing regime as well. So let's look at the results. Normal <clears throat> intestinal permeability, low fecal calprotectin. So I think that kind of rules out some of the things that were on that list. Now, from a breath test result perspective, you know, here we've got the lactulose breath test here. And 
essentially it's not positive, it's negative. You know, there's might be a slight blip at the 100 minute mark where it bumps up to you know, seven parts per million, but no, nowhere near that's only 20 part per million cutoff. Um, but here we look at the glucose result and we can actually see the 30 minute mark, it's positive. And then on the fructose test, look at that, nearly 100 part per million increase at the 40 minute mark. And this pa pattern of, of a really extreme breath gas result on fructose is really common. In my, in my SIBO patients. And the key thing here is noting the time at which the rise occurs with the fructose. It's happening at that 20, 40 minute mark where you see this huge rise. That is small intestinal. That's not colon, that's small intestine. Um, just like we see that rise at a similar time point um, with the glucose test. But again, we don't see that rise on the lactulose with this patient. And if I'd only used lactulose as my sole sugar, I would have actually missed SIBO in this patient. And he may have been misdiagnosed once again, as he had been for the last sort of 13 years and, and treatment would have gone down a different path than what it actually did. You know, so for me, after getting the breath test results in, hydrogen dominant SIBO with secondary fructose intolerance. And the, the term secondary fructose intolerance isn't used much in the medical literature, but it fits this scenario beautifully because we treat that, we treat the SIBO and they no longer have fructose intolerance. And this differentiates from, from the, the classic fructose intolerance where the rise of gas is in the colon and they're kind of this lifelong low, low fructose diet. You can't just treat it <laughs> with some herbs and it goes away, but it can when it's actually SIBO-induced fructose intolerance. And yes, I think he's probably got celiac as well, but we need to do you know, a gluten binge, um, gluten challenge, and then follow up biopsy and such like that. So we'll leave that to the side for the moment. And, and, and we, by, by treating the SIBO, and I think you had symptomatic improvement each previous time you took certain antimicrobials because it was inadvertently targeting the SIBO. It just, because the, the herbs weren't necessarily put together, quite right for targeting SIBO and there's no maintenance strategies put in place to prevent it from coming back, it would always just come back in this patient. But now we know what it is, we can get much better treatment outcomes from it. Um, now I'm gonna whip through these stuff on, on breath test interpretation because I think you know most people are gonna be up on this, but I just wanted to flag it for those people because we're gonna look at a few different test results. For some people that are, don't look at breath test results all day, every day, <laughs> like Elson and myself. Um, you know, and, and I think part of this is flagging too that pre-2017, this was kind of uh, cowboy country where different labs had completely different interpretive guidance and like some labs were using three parts per million methane as being positive and some labs were using any rise of you know, 12 or 15 parts per million hydrogen unit three hour mark as being positive. So I love this stuff in 2017 where they tried to standardize this a bit more of looking at that 20 parts per million on lactulose and glucose, uh, methane 10 parts in any time point. Um, and I'll probably move through this relatively quickly. I just wanted to more flag that one, it, what that, the cutoffs were. And even wanted to flag just in the UK, they see things a little bit differently in that they're using a 10 part per million hydrogen rise at the 60 minute mark um, rather than 90. And they see any rise between 60 and 90, you've got to have some clinical judgment in that. Is that like, could that be in the colon or is it going to be in the, it's still in the small bowel at that point. Um, and then obviously the change of just, you know, our old SIBO methane into intestinal within an overgrowth because we, they obviously occur in the colon as well and they aren't bacteria, which uh, is all very true. So essentially my approach to SIBO breath testing is this, lactulose and glucose all make sense from the, the literature. As we talked about at the very beginning, in Europe, they're often using glucose and recommending glucose and in North America, often using rec recommending lactulose and sometimes exclusively on both. And, and here in Australia, it's trying to grab the best of both worlds and go, let's do both. But what I started seeing is this. So the top graph here is what it, fructose intolerance is supposed to look like. So you ingest the fructose, you have no rise until that fructose reaches the colon. And there you see this ex expansion in, in hydrogen at that point, or it could be methane. But in this case, we see it in hydrogen. Um, that's what it's supposed to look like. That's what all the papers on fructose intolerance talk about. How often do I see this in my patients? Almost never. I had to search and search my files to find this first graph. What I see in my patients is this, the bottom diagram, and almost all of my patients where we see this massive spike in breath gases at an early time point, at that 30, 60 minute mark, we see that giant spike. And 
this just blew my mind at the time because I'm like, that's not what's supposed to be going on. We're supposed to be this fructose intolerance, according to all the literature, is this clonic fermentation that's going on. I mean, what we're seeing is is small bowel fermentation, and and also it's exaggerated breath results in terms of you know often the 100 200 sort of mark of of uh, parts per million of breath gases, um, and and sometimes I noticed that fructose would pick things up that glucose and lactulose did not. So that sort of made them, oh gosh, that's interesting. I want to start doing this in everybody. All my patients will now get lactulose, glucose, and fructose. So I have the best chance of seeing it. And then hopefully I'll eventually get enough data that I can do something slightly more formally with it, which is what occurred recently. Um, so let's look through some, some example breath test results that kind of formulated my, my, my approach. You know, here we have a patient where the lactulose, again, you see a kind of essentially flat lines, so there's not much rise up at the two, three hour mark. A little bit, but but certainly not much. Um, Glucose, you know, nothing to see there. You know, maybe a slight blip there, but again, no, not not close, quite close enough to the positive cutoff criteria. But here, look at that with the fructose. You know, you see this massive spike in gas at that early time window once again. Another test result where again it kind of flatlines. Glucose again, nothing to see here, um, and here again we see it on on fructose less less exaggerated response this time that it just sort of creeps over that sort of mixed SIBO kind of um, 15 part per million cutoff, um, but, but dramatically more symptoms from the fructose as well. But again, it was at that early time window, not later on in the colon from the fermentation perspective. So essentially for, for a presentation I was doing recently and to help answer Allison's question, <laughs> both at last, I decided to go, I want to take the last 130 patients that we've done this triple breath test sugaring on to work at, you know, how, which, what the results were, you know, are, were the sugars equally good or was one particularly better than the others, etc. So, and here are the results in graphical form and I'll walk you through it. And I think the next slide, between this and the next slide, it, it probably all come together, but all three were negative in, in 15 patients. So there was no rise in, um, any, any of the three sugars. So I, I define them as, as being negative. So, so 15 out of the 130, no, SIBO was not there. But what's interesting is 60 out of 130 were all, all three were positive. So if I would have done any of the sugars, they would have showed up. And you know, that's a pretty decent amount. But what I think is here is more telling, lactulose picked up SIBO eight occasions that the other sugars missed, only eight occasions. Fructose picked it up 19 occasions that the other two sugars missed. Glucose only four, four times. You know, because I think all that's what I was observing with the fructose, I, th I think really kind of like I started thinking more about what happens with fructose in the gut. You know, glucose, we know its main limitation is that it's actively absorbed in the upper small intestine. So if you have SIBO in the upper small bowel, yeah, it's, it's usually pretty accurate at sugar picking it up. But because your body so avidly grabs it, there's no glucose left in the middle to last bit of the small bowel, which is the main concern with, with using glucose alone. Now, lactulose, we know, is not absorbed. So it small bowel, first bit of the small bowel, middle bit, last bit, it's still there. But the issue with lactulose is that it's only selectively fermented. Um, and that not all bacteria have got the machinery to eat it. So they can be there in large amounts in the small bowel, but you won't see it on a lactulose test result. Um, but a, they, they eat glucose. But I think that they, what happens with fructose is they do. Fructose is almost universally consumed by bacteria. And it is slowly absorbed. So unlike glucose worth avid, we know glucose or fructose is, uh, I think it's carrier mediated facilitated diffusion is a technical term, but it means it's slow. <laughs> slow absorption rather than quick. And it means it's there in the middle small bowel. And I assume it's probably there at least to some degree in the last bit of the small bowel too. But it feeds a broader range of microbes. And I think that's why it is actually so good at picking up SIBO cases because it's kind of got some of the best of both worlds of the glucose and the lactulose. That's my theory anyway, to explain the results. And I think this next table hopefully makes it pretty clear too in that with these patients, I said 115 and 130, I would seem as positive because one of the sugars were positive. If I'd done lactulose only, I would have picked up the SIBO or EMO 73% of the time, 73%. And that kind of correlates with some of the data we have um, in terms of comparing it to some of the, the, you know, the so-called gold standard of aspirin culture, which we know has got some issues with it for sure. Fructose only would have picked it up 85% of the time if I'd only done that one thing. Um, glucose only 67% of the time. You know, so um, 
And what I used to do of just combining the lactulose and glucose doesn't actually increase diagnostic yield much, you know, 76.5% versus the lactulose alone was 73, you know, so it's not really probably worth, worth doing it, it just, just doing the glucose only. But if we just did glucose and fructose, we'd pick up 93% of the time, or even better, lactulose and fructose 96.5% of the time. And, and certainly since I've correlated the data together, that's what I've been doing with my patients is I've actually dropped glucose from the mix because there's, there's a small drop in, in, in diagnostic accuracy, arguably from that you know, 100% down to 96.5, but it's an extra cost, extra hassle of doing it and a few more days, potentially a week before you get your results in um, as well. So for that decrease in, slight decrease in diagnostic yield, I don't necessarily think it's worth the expense. And I've really shifted since I put this data together to working on just using lactulose and fructose based on that. And that's probably the bulk of the data that I want to share. Now, obviously there's some, some caveats here that I wish that I had like access to a, you know, the gold standard small bowel aspirate culture so we could do some, you know, correlative sort of data around that. I don't, you know, I'm a clinician, I'm a researcher, but I don't have access to that type of equipment, you know, so that, that is a limitation. But what I've found with these people that have that essentially SIBO picked up on fructose is you treat the SIBO and they can eat apples and pears and mangoes and watermelon and cherries again, you know, um, which is, which is not the case when it's a classic fructose where you get that rise in the colon. All right. So I'm open to, to questions or any discussion. Oh, that was it. Okay. Point. That was a very, that's simple. essentially it. Wow. Very wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, on, on the edge of our seats, waiting for more brilliance. It, you just keep topping yourself. That was fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. How's your patient? So how is the patient now? It, listen, there's, there's still ongoing stuff that we're still trying to tease out, but much better after that, for the first little bit after that, that treatment, because I still think we're trying to work out the celiac <laughs> component. Yeah of that. And it's, there's mm -hmm. some interesting aspects of this case in terms of uh, low fecal last days and a few other things that fit this, this, the C the C picture. Um, yes. Very cool. Very cool. Allison, Dr. C Becker, what questions do you have? Okay. I have a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> this is just absolutely amazing. I was just like smiling the whole way through. Okay. First question would be for, um, for people who might feel unsure to start using fructose, just based on this um, data, you know, just cause they haven't done it. Yeah. Can you, can you put our minds at ease that are you seeing good clinical correlation? So the people you're picking up on fructose who you didn't pick up on the other tests, you're treating them for SIBO and you're seeing improvement. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And, and that was the case earlier on in that, um, and it's funny because I've even had, I remember this one patient who had had you know, a 10 year diagnosis of fructose intolerance. She comes to me and she had a breath test she did 10 years prior. And I said, you know, can I see your, your breath test result? You know, and she'd been suffering with ongoing symptoms despite going on a low, uh, low fructose, low FODMAP diet, you know, about that time, 10 years ago, um, some ongoing symptoms, it was better, but not improved. We look at the breath test result and it's like, that's SIBO. It's like this huge spike, an early window here, let's treat the SIBO. She can eat all those foods again. You know, and, and that case to me just illustrates so beautifully um, because she was kind of not misdiagnosed as perhaps an over, or, over description of what occurred being labeled as fructose intolerance because she was, it just wasn't treating the cause. The cause was SIBO. You treat that and all of a sudden the people's diets open up again and all the, the whole bunch of other symptoms improve in a way. So, so I, I, yes, definitely I'm seeing that, that clinical correlation. That and I'm suspecting SIBO in these patients as well. It's just that um, I wasn't finding that lash is always interesting enough picks it up, whereas fructose did in a lot of patients. Actually, on that note, um, I know you have said in the past, it's mainly proteobacteria that don't ferment lactulose. W yeah. What are some of the names of those proteobacteria? Are we familiar with them? Yeah. So that'd be things like E. coli, Klebsiella, for example, Citrobacter, um, Haemophilus are, are common gram negative bacteria that don't really have the capacity to ferment lactulose. And, and to me, this is the interesting thing, because for me, I started doing research in irritable bowel syndrome back in 2000, and I was treating my IBS patients with lactulose as a prebiotic 
as, as a substance to feed up good bacteria. And then someone came up with this idea of using it as a breath test. I'm like, what? are you just testing for good bacteria in the, the gut? Like what's the, it just kind of blew my mind because all the research before that was often around its prebiotic qualities. It used to be added to infant formula as a prebiotic sugar back in the 1950s and 60s. You know, so there's a lot of data on increasing being how selectively it's fermented. And to me, that was always my, my limitation of, of, of or distrusting just lactulose because like I know it's not going to feed some bugs that can be there we know from the research and, and then we've got better research now that, that's looked at sampling the small bowel to see what bugs are there but even that previous research found you know gram negative bacteria and things like bacteroides being present and those things don't eat lactulose for the most part you know um, with the odd exception so so it, it made sense to me why I was seeing these flat lines with or the non-increase in the small bowel section with lactulose but I could with other sugars and what I like with the fructose is it does it's kind of a universal food source for those gram negative bugs which we now know are often the most common bugs found there. Well, yeah, I mean, that's just astonishing that because, you know, Dr. Pimentel's new research, well, fairly new, says, shows that hydrogen SIBO is E. coli and Klebsiella, and yet those don't ferment lactose. It's really astonishing. Uh, you know, hearing all of this, hearing that, and your description um, about the three substrates really would make fructose the ideal, really the ideal substrate, because it eats everything, ferments everything, and it's um, not quickly absorbed. I mean, it yeah, is yeah. absorbed. I mean, lactulose is absolutely not absorbed, being synthetic. Fructose is, but very slowly. That's right. And I would love someone to do some research on just looking, because it'd be great if we could do one test and we have some greater validity data around it instead of having to do two or three. You know, and as I said, I dropped from three down to two because I'm pretty confident that we'll pick it up with the two. But based on the data that I've got, I, I, if I had to choose one test, for someone who's financially limited, I would just choose fructose. Okay, on that note of financially limited, and by the way, yeah. um, if you want, you can stop screen sharing and then people will see your, ah, okay. your yeah. face better. <laughs> ah, okay, great. Give me a second. I will see if I can do that. Well, and also people in America wouldn't need a prescription. That's true. And that oh, would make life really easier too. Oh, really good point. Yeah. Super good point. And is lactulose is not prescription where you are? No, no. I've been using it therapeutically as a prebiotic for my patients for, for like 21 years. And any every chemist has got it. It's easy to come by. It's inexpensive. And, and yes, from a testing perspective, it's easy access for patients because they can order it themselves. They don't need a, a doctor to, to be involved with, with getting it. That's just amazing. Okay, so on that note of um, finances and logistics, um, so you've been doing double testing and, and then for quite some time, triple testing. Now you're back down to double cause you've switched. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that financially and how it works for patients? Like, are most people able to do that? Um, yeah. Most, most are. That's not everybody, but most of my patients are. And the people I work with, I think are a bit ones like, like some of you, Allison, that they've been unwell for a long time. And they've been waiting to get clarity from a diagnostic perspective for potentially many years. So at this point, they're actually, I want answers. <laughs> so they're okay with actually paying for testing to get those answers, you know, and, and I'll talk to patients about the pros and cons of, of testing versus not testing. If, if finances are limited, then, you know, again, maybe we'll just do one fructose or, you know, you, you could, you know, diagnose based on presumed SIBO, but and it, you know, again, like of the 130 people I thought were I quite likely thought had SIBO, 115 did. So, you know, it's not bad odds, but again, there's methane versus hydrogen. And yeah, we know there's, there's patterns that usually fit that most people with methane are constipated and most people with hydrogen have diarrhea, but it's not always that way. You know, you get the occasional person that's got diarrhea and high methane and you wouldn't, would treat quite inappropriately if you had not done the testing around it. Um, so I, I, I always urge to do, get the testing done to, to get the definitive answer around that. And my patients generally have, have, have been quite amenable to doing it. Okay. And so, as you said, for people who really financially can't, your data that, that was on the screen for quite a long time there showed um, yeah. fructose would be your, your best bet as any yeah. single one. Um, it would, because it picked it up in more cases that other sugars missed. And you combine that with, with the data that all, all of them are, were right. It was, it was the most accurate. Yeah. I looked at some of the other numbers in that you had 60, 60 patients who were positive for, with all three substrates, yeah, yeah. but it was, it was 31 patients who were positive with, with, um, not with all three, but with one or another. Um, and my, I'm always, I'm not a statistician, so my math isn't like perfect here, but yeah. just quick, quick look, because I added up 19, eight and four. That's what I did there. <laughs> 
Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right? And so yeah. that's half. That's half of, you know, of the people that, that came positive on all three, half didn't. And, you know, your best bet is going to be fructose within there, which is really fascinating, yeah. you know? Yeah, it, it totally was for me because th this that was my feeling from looking at those these results over the years was like, I reckon fructose is, is, the, is, the, is the most accurate one here. It's picking out more than glucose, picking it more than lactulose. But it was nice to actually correlate the data together because I did it in, in, in bits. So I did my first 30 and I was like, ah, oh, yeah, look at that pattern. And then we got the next 100 patients added. And it's like exact same percentages as it was with 30. Um, and it's like, okay there's this, this, this pattern is definitely there and I'm very confident with, with, with fructose um, as part of that regime. And as I said, the, the data seems to suggest if you just had one, that would be the one. I have a question. I have a couple yeah. of questions. Um, so just as a personal note, I did test as fructose intolerant and I am fascinated by you saying the following words, fructose intolerance caused by SIBO. So I'd actually... I've never had that conversation before, and I have a lot of conversations about this topic. <laughs> what? How does that work? Essentially, it's just that fructose is being it's being used as a food source by by small bowel microbes okay. that are overgrown. So they're they're eating and like with they could be eating sucrose, they could be eating you know glucose, a bunch of other things. But in this case, fructose, lactose. That's common. Yeah, lactose. And this is and you see this with lactose too. And, and I've had other patients where I've done four, and I've added lactose in there too. If I suspect they're they're getting symptoms from milk and ice cream and things like that. Um, and you see again that that small intestinal spike on lactose, and you treat them, and they no longer have lactose intolerance. They no longer have fructose intolerance. Yeah. So it's just another marker of SIBO. So you know I don't why we just have glucose as, as, as an accepted marker and there's other food sugars that can feed microbes in the small bowel quite as well and might have other attributes that that make them even more appropriate to to assess the presence of SIBO. This is a little bit of a side thought but when I hear the word fructose and I think of sugars like that and your patient was on a low um, sugar diet because of candida and people are always trying to figure out if they have candida could there ever be a test, do you think, of a fructose breath test for candida? Does that, does that even work? I don't, I don't think this guy actually, this gentleman had candida. I think yeah, that he just was trialing error and it's worked out that this low sugar diet wasn't feeding his SIBO bugs as much. So his symptoms were reduced when he, when he ate that way. And essentially the fructose in those fruit was feeding the SIBO microbes. You know, I, I think we know that 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 SIFO exists. We know that that yeah. you know you can have candida and other fungal things overgrowing in the colon too. Uh, I, I mean, what I look forward to one day is we'll probably be able to swallow a little capsule that'll be able to sample bits of our small bowel as it makes its way down and tell us exactly what's overgrown and exactly what species. And I don't think that's too far away. And then then we can probably get away from using breath testing potentially altogether. But in the meantime, I think breath yeah. testing for us. Five dialogue. years. What do you think, doctor? Uh, I would like to think in five five years, but we'll yeah. see. Because they're already we're already swallowing those capsules, and we're getting a good look around. All we have to do is get yeah. some sort of sampling technology, and then using the DNA um, testing approaches, yeah. so we could actually categorize what bugs there are. That's exciting. That's very okay. Exciting. Now I have a um, yeah. couple of logistical questions. Yeah. Um, how do you perform uh, if you're doing two or three tests? How do you do the prep and on what days prep diet and what days do you take the tests? And do you have an order in which you prefer to do the different substrates? Yeah, that was a bit of trial and error, but that's a great question. Yes. So we do glucose first, fructose next, and then lactulose last. Um, that's what I've worked out because lactulose was the more most likely sugar to induce uh, a few days worth of symptoms after ingestion versus an acute flare symptoms that you got with the other ones. Yeah, so it kind of slows the process down. If you do lactulose first, you might have to wait a week for things to settle back down to the point where it seems okay to try adding another sugar in. So I found that glucose is the least likely to induce symptoms. Um, fructose is next and then, you know, well, long lasting symptoms rather than acute. Yeah, that would upset things. So, so definitely. So I generally get them to do a low FODMAP day for a low FODMAP diet for a day beforehand, maybe two, depending on how willing they are. <laughs> I think one day seems to be bearable, but you know, two obviously might be would be better. Um, and then they'll do the glucose. And if they have no symptoms, I'll get them to do fructose the next day. And if no symptoms, lactulose the next day, or or just acute symptoms like yeah, I've got some bloating or distension for for an hour, then it gets goes back down. You know, that's fine. Um, my concern with lactose is because it gets fermented in the colon in everybody, um, it might upset the gas dynamics a bit 
to, you know, it's not, not symptomatic. So I think, okay, well, let's leave that for the end because in, in, if all going well, you shouldn't produce gas from fructose or glucose. You know, if your gut's behaving properly, it should be absorbed and there's no gas being made. Okay, so that goes right along with uh, the way I had been teaching to do, if you're gonna do glucose and lactulose, day one is your prep diet. Day two, you do the glucose breath test in the morning, but then you follow the prep diet again for yep. that day. And then in the morning of day three, in this case, we would be doing fructose, uh, you know, or yep. you would be doing lactulose if in our old way. Um, yep. But but now the way it's going to be, because you do fructose and lactulose, is day two is fructose, yep. and then day three is lactulose. And then after yes. the lactulose, you don't need to do any more prep diet because you're yep. done. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And I think that's the advantage of dropping it down from three to two. One of the advantages, I mean, I think for my patients, they pay out of hand for the breast test results. So it's about 120 bucks, 120, $140 per sugar. So, you know, there's a bit of cost there, but it's actually extra days involved with prep diet days involved with, you know, just one day of sitting around at home, 20 minutes, breathing in bags. Still, if we can avoid that and still get good results, I'm happy with that. I just wasn't happy with this using a single sugar that I couldn't necessarily trust. And I still think, and I still push very much for lactulose and fructose. You know, I think that it still gives us the broadest, picks up the most SIBO cases for the least cost and the least effort. Okay, I have one more logistical, but Siobhan, did you have a question? Uh, I think you asked it. Okay, okay. So also, um, you and I have talked about this, Jason, but in um, a lot of most breath testing labs, they do lactulose, I'm sorry, they do lactose and fructose as a four tube, uh, sampled every hour, baseline, and then every hour. Um, and obviously you're doing it like a standard SIBO test, either testing every 15, 20 or 30 minutes. Yeah. So can you explain how you handle this? Um, because you don't have your own machine, right? You're still- I, No, I, I don't, I'm using external labs. I'm lucky that here in Australia, we've actually got a, a number of labs or a couple, two at least that will do, that do fructose 20 minute by default. So I, that was, I, I always had 20 minutes by default with lack of fructose. When I first started ordering, it was always 20 minutes, which was great. Cause I think if I would have been stuck with uh, the 60 minute ones, it's like, I wouldn't have seen a pattern. You know, you would have seen maybe with Wait, normal 60 it? minutes. What is the 20 minute by default? Can you explain it? Essentially that you do, you're breathing into one of those tubes every 20 minutes, just like oh, okay. you do with lactulose. Yeah. Okay. Whereas I, I agree that some of those labs are doing fructose by the, by 60 minutes, every 60 minutes you breathe into a tube and it's like, oh, you miss so much information. It's so useless. much. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would not ever recommend that. I think you've really got to do it. 30 minutes is bearable, but actually my, my patients that, that are US based, I generally suggest that they, um, instead of doing it every 30 minutes, they do every 20 minutes, you know, um, and they just, Yes, maybe it'll go for two hours instead of three, which is less than ideal, but I'd actually rather get that clear data to see that. So as many breath points we get be before 90 minutes, the more accurate information we have to work with. And I think that 30, 60, 90, eh, it's okay, but 20, 40, 60, 80 is much, much better. And um, so uh, in my experience with labs I've worked with, generally you could just call and ask for what you want. They'll just adjust their pricing. Same thing. You're just saying, please send me this many tubes. I want to test every 20 minutes. And the other yeah. thing is you and I are both a fan of testing throughout the third hour to get the inf all the information we need. So you're yeah. doing that as well. You're making sure you yeah. get enough tube samples that brings you all the way through three yeah. full hours. Because I think it's, it's the methane stuff, you know, because sometimes we don't see that clonic methane rise until the two or three hour, or, you know, between the two and three hour mark. And if we just had it at two hours, we're going to miss, miss that. And again, that means misdiagnosed patients and mistreated patients potentially. So yeah, I fully concur. I do note that your prices um, are a little bit cheaper than in the, in the U.S. So I, I think some people will groan about the price of trying to do two, but at least we have this information that people should probably be trying uh, fructose as their first choice. Really fascinating. I had... Um, I think one more just general point I wanted to make, which was in listening to your, um, you know, your case example was, was such a great example of the thing that I'm really seeking out and that you are because we see people who failed other treatments, yeah. which is that I don't want to miss a SIBO patient. And that's what is really standing out to me here is, is that we just, we don't want to be doing our SIBO tests missing them and then and then how many more years are they spinning their wheels 
I totally hear you. And, and that to me is what, what the data showed. And when I started seeing all those sort of flatline latch it's just like, I would have, or the rise of the, in, in the colon period, I would have missed that if I just done that. Or if I just did glucose, again, I would have missed cases or just those two, I would have missed cases. So it really was about trying like, how do we find out what's wrong with this person properly <laughs> this time? I, yeah, because I, I agree. We're working with people that have been misdiagnosed potentially for years and we don't want to add to that. Okay, Thank that's you. all my questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I know it all leads to even more questions, but that's a great foundation right there. I want to thank both of you for taking the time to share this information and uh, keep up the great work. And we really appreciate your devotion to the cause. Thank you oh, so thank much, you. Jason. Uh, thank you for, for having me on. It's been great chatting with you. And, and I'm just excited getting information out there because I think that's it's good to get other clinicians doing it and seeing what they're observing and hopefully get some researchers on board to go, hey, let's check this because it could revolutionize treatment results or improve treatment results. And, and I think that's good, a huge thing that we're all wanting, you know, in terms of better diagnostic accuracy is a huge win for patients and practitioners. Absolutely. Thank you.